Thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Jenny Hornick and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's webinar with JMI Mental Health, the official journal of the Society of Digital Psychiatry. So today's topic is going to be on digital therapeutics in advancing modern mental health care. So I'll pass things on to Dr. John Torres in just a moment to introduce our special guest today. But before I do, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. So first off, um, all of your microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the event, but we do encourage that you ask the panel questions and there will be a designated time for them to answer them towards the end. So to ask your questions, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box that's towards the bottom of your screen. And secondly, this uh, webinar is going to be recorded and we'll be sharing it to our YouTube channel following the event. So you will be able to access it later or share it with peers who might be interested in the topic. So that's all for me. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the Director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the Editor-in-Chief of JMIR Mental Health. So I will go ahead and kick things off to John. Thank you to Jenny and JMIR and the Society of Digital Psychiatry. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Avi Pratap, who you have to keep up with his title. He's now the Executive Director of Global Evidence Lead for Boringer Ingelheim. And before he was the Senior Clinical Program Lead, he also in the past was the Head of Data Innovation for Biogen Digital, Digital Health. He did his PhD in Digital Mental Health at University of Washington. And if you look across PubMed in the internet of papers that are high impact and fascinating about all of digital health, especially in mental health. His name has been there. He's someone I've personally collaborated with on many papers and who I turn to. And now he's leading up some very exciting schizophrenia efforts. So I'll let you start, Avi, with a disclosure. And then I have so many questions to, to, to give to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I do see some familiar names even in the attendees list. So thank you all for coming here. Uh, my name is Abhi Pratap. And just a quick disclosure, today's question Q&A and any discussion is my own opinions. It's not necessarily re reflecting anything from my employer, Bering or Ingelheim. And I think that's important. Um, I'm very happy to share my own views. Thank you for that preamble. And I, I think this is such an evolving space. We are just talking as two people who have done a lot of research in the space about what could be, what should be, and what is happening. But maybe, Avi, we, we get a lot of people listening here who are on their career journeys. They, they want to start a career in digital health. They would like an industry role. And I think more than anyone else, you have figured out how to do the most rigorous evidence, work in the large scale studies, work in industry, could you share for people a little bit about your background and how it led you to this exciting kind of role at the intersection of digital health industry and academic evidence? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll start by saying, uh, no matter how many books you read, your kid is your own kid and you have your own experiences with, with that kid. Um, so I think um, I would have never imagined that I will be doing this, what I'm doing, but I think uh, thanks to a lot of people and my mentors who helped me got where I am, but I think at the end of the day, it's finally understanding and being in the devil in the details of what I was doing. So I used to do a lot of pomp bio and looking at genes and omics, moving on to a lot more on the data analysis side. And I think each ladder helped me understand the importance of working with bench scientists to get to the bottom of what they are doing and how the data analytics needs to probe the right question for downstream hypotheses onto working with people who really cared about how do you generate that hypothesis into meaningful visualizations. And then to working with patients with my clinician friends and partners in different hospital settings to really understand what moves the needle for patients. So I think for me, it was a holistic ladder based experience, which I'm very fortunate to have understanding the downstream bench work to what is the importance of looking at data from a very holistic perspective, whether it's genes or phenotype or patient derived data, and then putting it all together into a clinical development recipe on what moves the needle 
for regulators, for clinicians, and most important stakeholder patients and their families. And I think there is only one way of doing it, which is to actually do it yourself, which is fascinating sometimes. I think your point too, that the, the, the devil is in the details, but get, getting into those messy details is, yes. it's hard. We're, it, it's not easy, but I think the concept of digital health makes sense to hopefully everyone here listening and broader, but I think the details are are really tricky and intricate. And I think that's good advice to people is to, to embrace some of those details and to dive down into them. I know today we're going to talk about digital therapeutics, which is a term that has been defined by many people to mean many things. What would it personally mean to you, Avi? Yes, uh, it's it's a pretty loaded one. And I think uh, there are so many definitions and an IEEE official definition. And I do recommend you to read all that. I will not remember it point by point. But the point for me is you're bringing digital to have a meaningful change in the lives of patients and hopefully having improve, improving their symptoms and, and have, having them better manage their symptoms, et cetera. So I think in mental health specifically, bringing in digital, which is evidence-based to provide them um, interventions that actually can help their improve their lifestyle, improve their quality of life at the end of the day is a digital therapeutic. It can take many shape and forms. You can do it via a website, via an app, via a, a telemedicine discussion with your provider, et cetera. So all of that brings together and ultimately how do you have digital component that can enhance patient's journey in their care continuum and can make them feel better, their quality of life is better, and perhaps uh, on the other side, in a way and at a, in a time uh, that is dependent on their needs, so they don't have to be, it's not 8 to 8 p.m., it could be midnight when someone needs help, so I think that's the nuance. Can it improve the life of the patients? Can it make a clinically relevant change that is also helping patients get better? And if you're paying attention, then the safety profile is really benign. So in, in terms of those adverse events, there are not many, which is really good. Yeah. And I, I like that. That's a I like that holistic approach of what it could be because there's a lot of different things it could be. And maybe that's why we have so many definitions, is they're all right in, in some degree with it. You've done a, a wealth of different studies you've looked at different conditions, not only mental health. I know recently you've been focusing on schizophrenia as one area to look at what these digital therapeutics could be. Why Why would you personally think schizophrenia is the right space for, for innovation in digital health? Yeah, uh, it's, it's again a loaded one and a very important one, right? Um, for those of us who are in the, uh, in the SMI research arena, uh, it's very clear schizophrenia has a variety of unmet needs, right? Beyond the stabilization with first or second generation of antipsychotics, there is a lot of unmet need in negative symptoms, uh, in cognitive uh, impairment in the disease. So there are very clear areas where there is unmet need. And Sometimes um, some of the digital centered ways of addressing, for example, negative symptoms, anhedonia, abolition, et cetera, uh, allogia, uh, are really a right way to help people break their negative thoughts. How do you sort of break someone and say in, in their negative thinking to say, you actually could do better. This is a way to make them reinforce. And these are all various flavors of psychosocial cognitive behavioral CBTs, and some of them are better suited to sort of digital means. And I'll give you another example, right? So there has been so much work in Parkinson's in terms of uh, looking at tremors, and that's where some of the highly fidelity, uh, highly fidable sensors in uh, iPhones are really good, right? You can capture someone's uh, hand, how much they have tremor. And similarly, in mental health, uh, some of the psychotherapeutic ways of uh, imparting the care through digital is a right medium fit. So it blends nicely. There is clear unmet need. At the same time, the medium also allows patients to hopefully engage if done in a very patient-centric way. So that's a key. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, I would fully agree. I'll put in the chat, this was, it does include your more most recent research, which is still in the research stage, but we even did a review paper last year just looking at schizophrenia as a space for 
innovation in digital health. And it, it really are there some leading examples of regulation of high quality studies of different control groups. And I think sometimes there's a stigma that patients with a psychotic disorder don't want to use technology. That's not true. People are people. People use technology that it'll make people more paranoid. There's no evidence of that. So I think once you get beyond the stigma of this condition, you realize that there's people that really have needs that are unmet and they're, they're and, excited and to I the think, technology. Uh... John, you raise a very interesting point and maybe just a, just a minor double click on it, right? Like one is to look at digital health as a whole and how people are engaging with it. And we need to, to dichotomize this. One is observational research studies as just pure assessment. And then there are interventional studies that are meant to give patients some benefit. And I think there they needs to be distinguished or kept separately. We have some unpublished but already shared data in our early learning studies and this patient population, so it's important, I'm only talking about schizophrenia patient population, had shown a, a remarkable engagement in our early learning studies and it's uh, hopefully that data becomes available to, to everyone in the community. And I, I think really important to understand, are we able to fit their needs? how do we understand those needs so the technology becomes part of their life and it's dissolved into their day-to-day -day living and it's not questionable or hopefully not burdensome and is meant to enable their daily lives. So these are a mouthful things, but it's really important to practice and implement those. Yeah, and around the theme of implementation, I, I think I'll, I'll speak, I think one trend I've noticed at least in research papers come out and talking to people is, it's good to have data or insights from technology. It's better if it's clinically actionable or it's integrated as part of the treatment plan or if the clinician, be it a psychiatrist, nurse practitioner, social worker, peer support, it, it, if, a, if a clinician is acting on it, how do we bridge that world from people have a phone, they're willing to use it, we can learn insights to the clinical side of it? Yeah, I think, John, you're loaded with a couple of million dollar questions, if not more today. Um, I, I think it's really the will determine the strength of the PDT or DTX world in the near future, because you can have the best solution if people don't come and use it is as good as not being used in the real world setting. So it's crucial to understand how an evidence-based therapy. So first of all, it needs to stand the test of evidence review by our peers. If you assume that is true, then how do we make it easy for the health practitioner community from nurses, research coordinators, uh, and, and care staff to the clinicians is really an active work in progress. There's a lot of implementation-based science that needs to come in here. User centricity, not just for patients, their families, but also the care team. But at the end of the day, one needs to be clear at what point this gets pres prescribed, quote unquote, right? If that is prescription, um, yeah. what data comes back to the clin clinical team so that they are not overwhelmed. There needs to be some training on that, whether it's engagement, clinical efficacy, et cetera, and how they imbibe that into their clinical decision-making. These are all very important and a lot of implementation-based questions that if you look at even NIMH, they are very interested in looking at how do you bring this to the front end of the clinic. So today I'm not giving a bullet list of one, two, three, but suffice to say, there is a lot of boots on the ground practice that needs to happen to really understand what the stakeholders need and then go about implementing those. Those solutions cannot be developed in a sitting room and just say, we know it all and we'll do it. And it doesn't happen like this. If we build it, they will come. It does not happen in digital health. And time and again, we have seen this. No, it, it, exactly. They, they certainly don't come. And if they come, sometimes they leave very quickly, very which is early. equally sometimes challenging too. I think on the theme of getting clinicians and healthcare systems to use some of these tools, again, the ones that are evidence-based, Clearly, reimbursement is part of the discussion. I don't think anyone in the world fully understands reimbursement for digital mental health. I'm not going to ask yes. you to tell us where it is, but do you see even just broad trends globally yes. on how this is going without 
Um, with full disclaimer that I'm not a, a commercial guy for sure. So I'm going to share some of my brief uh, understanding or lack thereof. At the end of the day, guys, if we all look up the recent evidence in PDTs, right, I'm going to leave it to you to make your own judgment, right? But it suffice to say there is a lot more that needs to be done. The value or the ask by payers is actually very genuine. Why should I reimburse this, right? Um, is it efficacious? Is it effective in real world setting? Um, and on based on what constraints, that could be depending on different disease areas, unmet need and different population level challenges. And as clinical developers, we need to have clear, well thought, data based answers for that. Payers are very rational in their questions on what they're asking for. Um, but I, I don't think it's one size fits everything. At the end of the day, they are looking for solid evidence that shows this is what I got in my pivotal study. This is what I got in the real world study. And how do they compare and contrast? And at the end of the day, is it really helping patient over time? And where is the proof for that? So it's a very mathematical, clear ask from them. We just have to come and get used to this recipe of this is the burden of proof or evidence that we need. And I think slowly over time with many of the recent approvals or clearances in PDT, it's gonna become muscle memory. We just started the very early start of it and it's okay to have some setbacks. Yeah, and my almost interpretation of your, I, it's almost like there's, we're excited about digital, but it's not exceptional. It's not, it doesn't mean it gets a pass for evidence. It gets a pass yeah. for and it shouldn't. efficacy it, it, and it shouldn't. And I, yeah. I think that's what's exciting about the approach that you're taking. You're saying, well, I can put it up to the highest standards and prove it works at those standards. And then it can be reimbursed at those standards, which yeah. makes, it makes a lot of sense as a Approach because uh, if we are talking in the prescriptional regulation uh, regulatory uh, bucket, but there could be another bucket which could be different, right? So I encourage everyone to read um, some of the recent guidance from FDA and other uh, even payer white papers on what is a digital companion, what is a digital therapeutic, and what is a PDT. It's fascinating to see what people are thinking about it, and from a regulatory and payer standpoint. And for those listening, PDT would be prescription digital therapeutic, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's second and, nature to me. <laughs> it's the, 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 it, There's a lot of terms in this space, too, as we talk about the details are important, but it, it's a complex space. Yeah. In terms of, again, I, I think you gave some advice at the beginning for people that want a career in digital health. They, they want to work of industry because they also want to do things at scale and build these new things. Where do we even start? Do you knock on your door and say, I would like to work with you, Avi? Do you do a PhD? Do you found a company? Like wh where? Yeah, that's a, I, I love that question and I can go on and on, but I'll try to be some somewhat crisp. Um, there are some actually really nice ways to go about this. First, I encourage everyone to spend some time on ct.gov, so clinicaltrials.gov, and understand where the struggle is, right? That's the Bible of where people are designing trials, and so much of information is available through that portal for open, closed trials, protocols, ICFs, et cetera. Understand what people have done and where challenges are. That's one. Second, make sure you have read every possible um, study paper that has recently come out because that gives you some context on where challenges are. And third, pick your battle, right? Either you are a data person or a regulatory person or this, right? It, it's hard to be everything, but it's really important to bring something crisp to the table, whether it's your analytical skills or your regulatory aspect of it. So pick one. And then finally, be very clear. Is it digital health, digital therapeutics? They are not same at all. Um, so are you measuring people? Are you enjoying doing that work? Are you trying to intervene? And hopefully in the future, you could do both. But it's very difficult to innovate on both the levels at the same time. And if you're taking one thing home from this, digital health and digital therapeutics are not same. Sorry. That's, that's actually a useful way of, of exploring all the information that's out there to, to see the landscape. And I imagine every six months, it probably looks different, I dare imagine. Yes, it does. <laughs> It's a lot of free information that is very insightful. Yeah, for it. I think what I want to do is open up for about the next 10 minutes or go for, for, for questions. I already see some coming in here. And th this is it. 
interesting question about AI, and it's from actually one of our JMIR authors, I'll put his paper in the chat, but it says, having experienced both sides of the data and having a schizophrenia issue, I have a question regarding AI's role in this context. Do you think that the categorization performed by AI classification employees, patients, others might inadvertently incorporate mental health stigma into training models? Given these algorithms are now a hidden part of our daily lives, I wonder what implications that they may have. A good it's question, a, very, a hard question too. It's a very hard, but a very relevant question. And I may not have all the answers, but one thing I'll demand but from everyone is transparency, right? What yeah. are you doing in your digital health? Are you capturing data and then feeding into something to bring something out? And that all that spectrum has to be very clear from the get-go. A pre-specification helps. Transparency with patient health, right? We have worked with so many patients where they thought, you will take all this data and sort of create uh, something for me. And it's some it's all a lot of thought process. It's different answer if you're working with the uh, SMI population that have their own reasons to be skeptical versus um, a neurodegenerative area. So understanding your target population is important. Being very clear, ask your teams 10 times on why do you want to capture this third what is the transparent rule of telling AI? Until this point, I know because I have representative data to make inference. And if something comes outside those points, setting the boundaries clearly, I will back off transparently and tell the user or my, my creator that this is not my guessing game, right? So yeah. I think all this is really important to, to chart the territory and there's so much work being done, but we are just getting started. There are some nonprofits that are now setting up how do you bring these rules to the patients so they can understand what is being done, what is the primary use of the data, secondary, all that is important. Lastly, at the end of the day, data privacy trumps everything else. We need, we, we have an obligation to be very clear and transparent to our patient population on what we are doing, why we are capturing the data and what we will do with that. That's my very strong personal opinion. I think almost everyone would hopefully agree that we need transparency, and especially as some of these AI models, as we've talked about before, it depends what they're trained on is what they'll imitate and respond. So, so we certainly don't want bias to be baked in. This is a question, Avi, and again, you don't work for the FDA, I don't work for the FDA, so we, we can't speak on behalf of the FDA, but it says, on the broad definition given by Dr. Abi. Is that consistent with how the FDA would approve digital therapeutics? Could he elaborate on the clinical review standards for evidence in digital mental health? And where is the bar between diagnostic and delivering care? So a lot of questions in one. Maybe we'll take the parts that are yeah, I cannot easy respond to do on quickly. FDA's behalf by, by all means, right? And I, and I think uh, what I'm trying to get at is, is it a diagnostic product? So you are measuring something and making a diagnostic. Is it a delivering care? So it's helping person along their journey. I think a diagnostic app is not a PDT, right? Um, that is clear in my head. Um, but I think if it's helping patient in their journey uh, and hoping making them better in their quality of life, giving evidence-based treatment, I think that is where it becomes more digital therapeutic and sort of lands in the PDT space following FDA clearance. I would encourage you to read the IEEE definition for a very formal definition of it, which puts a real good boundary, but diagnostic is definitely not in the PDT space. Now, lastly, if you are diagnosing somehow or actually measuring somehow, then you can have just-in-time interventions in the future that could become part of a PDT package, but that's also uh, just thinking out loud with you. Yeah, it's the, the, the definitions do get confusing of what they are, but I think that's actually a very nice way to, to break it down. This is a question not on, on regulatory, but I think an equally important one looking at communities that have been marginalized. And we know in the past that access to mental health care has not been equal or equitable. We know that treatments have worked differently for different people. If we have this new opportunity to, yeah. to build something new of these digital therapeutics, what can we do to hopefully increase access or engagement to care for these communities that haven't had the best access before, to be blunt? 
Yeah, uh, frankly, I love this question because it's actually the reason why I do digital work, uh, honestly. And I think it really comes down to thinking through of your barriers. And I think the first and foremost thing we need to do is to understand what patient needs are and actually stick to them, be transparent with them, work with the, your target population, and then understand the limitations, right? There will always be some limitations of this, and I can tell you a few, right? Um, do you have the burden to create your solution in every possible language in your community? Perhaps, but maybe you want to start with something similar, simple that has majority covered, but, but you can say clearly the second version may come in the future if we have evidence, right? Because you don't want to take the, uh, the burden of creating everything from the get-go, but being transparent. Second, there are challenges. Who has the device? Who doesn't have a device? Do I do a study with Apple Watches? There are pros and cons. That doesn't mean Apple Watches studies are not good, right? But the boundary conditions have to be set up front, right? On what those are, um, it's perfectly all right to do a study with, with there, there might be access challenges to devices, but there are Obama phones available there. You can have a second version. It's important to think through of these biases, understand where your selection criteria will introduce bias in your results and be transparent about it. And then hopefully you have the full support to do that in the second, third version. Um, it's impossible to do everything at the same go with a unlimited budget, which are not available anywhere. Yeah, it's it definitely takes an iterative approach, as you yes. said. And for those of you from the US, we actually have a I know sometimes the U.S. is seen as not the nicest healthcare system, but we have a project called Project Lifeline through the Federal Communications Commission. It does get patients really good free smartphones. They're actually yes. pretty fancy. They show up, and I've signed up many of my patients for them, and they're they're quite happy with it. So I, I do think getting the smartphone is getting easier. As you alluded to, Avi, getting the digital literacy and then getting a tool that we want to use and it's clinically integrated Th those are the steps that are perhaps now more, more challenging. One related question is, how do you see these coming to low and middle income countries over the years or today? Yeah. Um, as someone being from LMIC, I'll say one thing. It will not be take this from this place and then give it to LMIC. That's the last and the worst thing you could do. Um, and, I, and I think the cultural adaptation, there's a lot of appetite and frankly, a lot of need in LMIC region where the number of providers in psychiatric uh, community, and John knows this better than me, will never meet the demand in at least our lifetimes. It's very clear. If you are motivated to do something, LMIC is one of the areas that is of deep importance and interest, but it's, it needs to be tailored. It's okay to develop it on the West side and then see what works and then, but you'll have to do some other studies in LMIC and do it. It cannot be an approved solution here goes there without any changes and just be working there. It's not gonna work like that. People have different ways. Even the social demographic understanding and how you ask it differs in different countries. Um, you can't even ask race in certain countries. So you have to understand the market and there could be some common denominators, but um, again, 50% of the community might understand English and that's a good enough start, but other 50% might need a psycholinguistic validation of your, your therapy before you can take it there. So a lot more to be done uh, in that regards. And uh, I think it's a very active area of research from many different researchers that I know personally. So not a yeah. full blown answer, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the challenges. But I think as you started to write, it's, it's the details. And I think these are good projects for anyone to, to dive into. I, I think you're almost telling us that no detail is not, every detail matters, right? If you want to work on translation, cultural adaptation, regulation, payment models, design, like there, there's a lot of yeah. ways to enter into the space and to do good pieces of work and iterate from it. It, it sounds like there's, there's many doors open and we need, we need help in it. So maybe on on that positive note, I'll I'll end. We we have so many more questions, but in part, I think we could spend a long time on them. And some of the regulatory details are going to be different by the yeah, time I'm people not a regulatory do it. Expert. So I'll I'll end again saying this was a conversation between me and Dr. Pratap. That was our personal opinions on what's happening in these devices. The space changes quickly and rapidly. That's what makes it exciting. But hopefully you got some inspiration for, from 
my colleague Abi on how you can start an exciting career in this space. Thank you so much, John. It was lovely. And I think people know how to get hold of me and I can, I'm more than happy to grab a virtual coffee if time makes it work. Yeah. Thank Cheers you everybody. all.